Okay. Everything's working tonight. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix. YouTubers, welcome to you too. Got a very encouraging uh, message tonight I wanted to share with you. But the most fun, of course, is, is the announcements. So we'll do those first because everybody loves them. Hey, the seminar is next week, part two, The Invisible World. That's a fun teaching. Here's all of our uh, other teachings. There's like 400 of them on there. It's our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. This service is on there tonight. Yesterday's was on there with uh, Brother Rick. If you uh, want to help us with the ministry financially, just uh, switch over from Google to Good Search and then put in our charity name, which would be that one. And then they'll pay us when you surf the web. Wish we had a TikTok thing like that. You can make a lot of money. Uh, I got uh, this incredibly important thing. This is the miracle list. This thing's amazing. Uh, it's a person will actually do it. You wouldn't believe it. I don't get very many people to actually do it, but unfortunately, if you can... Uh, pray through on this thing, you can get uh, in a position to find your destiny. I got it translated into two more languages. So, send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send it out immediately. We're starting a new monthly prayer group. It's on the fourth Saturday of every month at 11 o'clock in the Healing House, which is our residential facility next door. 11 o'clock next Saturday. Please come pray for the ministry. Thank you. Next Saturday in that sanctuary is my deliverance training class at noon after the prayer meeting at the healing house. There's my 18 classes on deliverance training. If you happen to be sensing a call into this kind of ministry, this save you a lot of time and trouble. Uh, guess what's going on on the planet Earth right now? Oh, well, then you'll get the seven churches of Revelation. That's in the bookstore. Please remember our Wednesday night Zoom services. Things, this thing is fantastic. Rick's on there. Stephanie's on there. I mean, it's really something special. 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Send me an email, and I'll send you the code, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. <clears throat> Please remember Julie's services, Tuesday nights. I was there last Tuesday. I was a guest speaker in her service. And uh, it was the altar call was fantastic. The teaching was a little light, but the altar call and the moving of the spirit was bang, red hot. Jennifer was there. It was really something. Uh, a lot of anointed ladies at that service. Monday night is a Zoom for the ladies only. Please remember. 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. The women are having a seminar in January. All right, women only. Women's conference on the 20th, January 20th. That's a Saturday. Hope you're planning on attending. There's our app. You can download that for donations if you want to. There's our donation boxes on the doors. You can donate there if you'd like to. You can donate on the website, on PayPal, if you'd like to. I've been on the radio for over 20 years here in Maricopa County. I collect all my shows and archive them. They're right here. Just go to the home page on the website, hit the media button, and then hit the streaming radio, and they're all right there. I'm on every day, Monday through Friday at 7.30 in the morning, and I'm on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon on 10, 10 a.m., and... Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock, I'm on 1100 AM Conservative Talk Radio here in Phoenix. Sundays at 8 AM. Then my podcast is at 9 AM on Sundays. Just go to twitch.tv and put in HCCADC and you're there. See you Sunday morning at 9. YouTubers, now, I want you to set up an ambush team in your church 
and I want you to start your healing and deliverance ministry. Do not despise small beginnings. You may have one person to pray for and get healed, but as soon as that person gets healed, you'll be shocked. Word of mouth will just carry the thing all the way through, and you'll be having a line of people standing up wanting to get healed. I guarantee it. <clears throat> you need to start that right away. Do it in secret. I wrote three books. They're in the bookstore. One on curing mental illness for Christians, one on Satan, one on divine healing. All of our programs down here are on these platforms Kelly set up for us. And on these platforms, those are the code words. Okay. We're also on Rumble, H-O-H-H-C-C, and you'll see all of our programs there. I'll see you in Carlsbad, California again, December 23rd, that's Saturday, California, okay? And uh, we'll be there at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Senior Center. I like to go there because I am a senior, and it seemed like it would be comfortable to go there. <laughs> it's on Pine Street, so you know we're going to have a great meeting. Suite 100, we're in rooms A and B, and uh, you know what's going to happen if you've been there before. Teaching on deliverance, and then bang, altar call, and then human garbage. Hey, you know, I've done a lot of teaching over the years on the spirit of rejection. He's a monster. He's all over the country. He's manifesting like crazy right now. If you've ever seen the news and seen Black Lives Matter, Antifa, Palestinian riots, and so on, behind all of that from childhood is this spirit of rejection that got into these kids, and he has, he's tearing this place up. But his main job, when he gets into your brain as a child, is to make you feel like you're trash, like you're unworthy, like you're a loser, like you're a piece of crap, like you're human garbage. Yeah? And uh, he does it to everybody. Trust me, you're nothing special. Uh, he treats everybody like trash. He's not singling you out for special treatment. Everybody gets treated like garbage by him. You're nothing special. The devil hates all of us. He is an indiscriminate hater and an indiscriminate destroyer. You're not being picked on. He picks on everybody. You're not being hated more than others. He hates everybody. And he's trying to destroy your self-concept and your self-esteem so that later on in life as you grow up and after you get saved, you will amount to a <coughs> Christian. Why? Because no Christian can be powerful or successful who has low self-esteem and who sees himself as an unworthy person. You will never be a successful Christian if you have that in your soul. And you will always be a yo-yo Christian, doing well today, tomorrow crashing. Doing great today, tomorrow you're down in the dumps. You're like a champion today, tomorrow you're human garbage. Up and down it goes, year in and year out, for the rest of your Christian life. If you don't get over this and get that spirit out of there, your Christian life is doomed. And I got some good news for you. And here's part of it. Check this out. Paul's talking to the Corinthian church. You know what happened there? He set up this incredible church. It was on fire. It was full of power. And then the devil moved in. What a surprise. The devil moved in and turned the Corinthians into carnal Christians. And here Paul's writing him. Several letters. We only have two of them, but we know he wrote several more. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here it is. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither will any of these inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gives us his big ten. 
Remember that? And there they are. Number one, who's not getting in? Hornus, sex perverts. Who else is not getting into heaven? Idolaters. Who else? Adulterers. Moikos. What's a moikos? It's a heterosexual adulterer, a, like like a player, like a like a swinger, like so. It's heterosexual sexual sin. Okay? Adultery is heterosexual sin. Fornication is all forms of sin, any form of sin. Could be anything. Necrophilia, pedophilia, incest, bestiality. If you can name any sex sin at all, that falls under the category of fornication. Adultery only applies to Yeah males and females and I don't want to get in a big fight over that, but They they used to call them males and females Let's go back a bit So it's heterosexual sex Okay, That's what he's saying here Moikos. Who else feminists Malikas males that are soft and weak like females self abusers Wow Male perverts who abuse other people, like a pedophile, for example. Thieves, kleptus, we get our English word what? Klepto. Right, kleptomania, kleptomaniac, so to speak. That's someone who steals stuff. Okay? Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not steal. Okay? As soon as you start stealing stuff, the demons put a curse on you. And then later in life, when you're trying to get ahead, People are stealing from you. Just hang on. <clears throat> if you steal when you're young, you it puts a curse on you. And then when you get older, people steal from you. Relatives steal from you, co-workers, family, friends. Your stuff starts getting stolen. It's a curse. Covetousness. Say a necklace, what is that? Yeah, people that are lovers of money, passionate about money, followers of money, money grubbers, so to speak. What's a methicist? What is that? That's where we get our English word methamphetamines, right? People who get involved in intoxicants. What are revelers? Lordosis? Yeah, those are people that verbally abuse other people, verbal abusers. Trashers, people who trash other people, people with critical spirits, you know, people with the glass is always half empty, it's never half full. Those type of people, and they verbally say negative things to you all the time. Was anybody raised with a mother like that? Mother was a nagger, one person, two people. Any, it's it's a nightmare. If you do five things right, they point out the sixth thing you screwed up. And they ignore the five things you did right. That kind of a person, that's what that kind of person is. Apply to what? Driving angry, yelling at people on the road. Oh no, that's a different that's a different oh, okay, that's a different one. Yeah. That one's worse. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I tried to let the guy off, but it you're getting healed tonight, sir. You come down here. <clears throat> Extortioners. What's a harpax? What's that? That's people that hoard stuff out of greed, you know, material things, money, coin, gold, silver coin. And they do it with greed. They're greedy. So they're hoarding. What is hoarding? It's a spirit of fear. All hoarders have a de demons of fear. Deep down inside, they have this anxiety. That they're not going to have something or they're not going to end up with something or They're going to lose something so they, they Hoard it in there yeah. There's your big ten from the great Apostle Paul those ten groups will not go where? Heaven that's correct 
lot of intelligent people in this section. This one, a little bit, <laughs> kind of dumbed down over here. Middle ground here. Good ones. Then Paul drops a bomb on the Corinthians. It explodes. Boom. You used to be just like them. There it is. But now you are washed in the blood. <laughs> now you are sanctified. Hagiazo, you are set apart for God, you Corinthians. You are justified by God. Dikaiao is a Greek word. It means to be declared innocent when you're 100% guilty. They got you dead to rights. And God said, no, you're innocent. You never did it. Even when you did it. You committed adultery. You lied. You cheated. You did all that. You got caught. And mercy said, no, you never did it. Justification. Incredible. That's incredible. I got stuff in my life that, man, I tell you what, I, re I regret up to here. I wish I hadn't have done it up to there. Justification was an enormous doctrine for me. I loved it when I studied it. I was so happy. Couldn't believe it. All the stinking crap I got involved in for decades, phew, gone. Huh? I see the looks on your face. You're all jealous of me. No, every person that drops on their knees, every single person, receives those benefits from the living Christ. No exceptions. Sanctified, set apart for God. I used to be set apart for the devil. I was his servant. Everything I want, he wanted me to do, I did. Everything I wanted me to say, I said. Not anymore. I've been sanctified. It means to be set apart for God. If you're born again a Christian, you're set apart for God. Yeah. You have a guardian angel that follows you around 24-7 and keeps you out of danger. 100% of you should already be dead right now. Your guardian angel saved you. What can't a guardian angel do? What can't they do? Overrun your free will. So if you say to yourself, I'm going to do this and that, a guardian angel can't stop you. He doesn't have the power to do it. I think I'm going to slip my wrist. Foop. Can't stop you. I think I'm going to let that person have it. You, MF. He's not going to stop you. You know why? Guardian angels only go up to the point of human free will. I'm on a speed. He's not going to stop you. If you move to San Francisco and you decide to pull over the side of the road and take a dump on the sidewalk, your guardian angel is not going to stop you. Elizabeth. Why? These people heard me. Did you guys hear me? Human free will cannot be overrun by an angel. They have limits. The car accident you didn't get in had nothing to do with your free will. That they blocked. Hello? Stuff that comes at you in the spirit world or in the natural world that you don't see and don't know about, your guardian angel steps in and he protects you. 
He protects you. Not a sinner. Sinners don't have them. Only born-again Christians have guardian angel. But if you decide to knock off a batch of porn tomorrow, your guardian angel is helpless to stop it. He doesn't want you to do it. He, it makes him sick to see you do it. Whatever, however. But he can't stop it. He doesn't have any power. God won't stop it either. That wasn't part of the Bible, so I just threw that in. See, that's a bonus. That's bonus material. Look at this. Such were some of you. You were all a bunch of stinking adulterers and covetous and liars and thieves. Oh, you Corinthians. You're all rotten to the core. You used to be just like them, but now you are washed in the blood, justified, sanctified. Cross of Calvary. Wow. There it is right there. In whose name? In Jesus' mighty name. By who? The Holy Ghost. This is a great verse to memorize because it sums up the whole gospel. This little section here kind of sums up the entire gospel. Of evangelism. It's the whole concept of evangelism. Everybody's a rotten, stinking, crotch rot ridden sinner. And suddenly they drop to their knees at Calvary. A miracle happens. The biggest miracle of all the Holy Ghost enters their spirit, man. They become born again Christian. They get a guardian angel. They're justified, sanctified. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amazing. Incredible. Mercy even covers the silly stories I tell here. See? You might be thinking, hey, these, these stories are asinine. Yeah, they are. I agree. But the, mercy covers it. You guys are all used to be trash and human garbage, but now you're not. How does God do this thing? Well, let's check it out. Who's this guy? Let's watch it. All right, this guy, they call him the miracle man. Why is that? Let me go over the smart section. Why do they call A A A Allen the miracle man? Now, I'm getting nothing, not, I'm no reads at all over there. I'm just this long night. Because he had racks of miracles. This guy saw every miracle in the book. Every healing you can imagine. This guy saw it. What kind of person did he used to be before, like Paul said? Well, he grew up with six siblings. Both of his parents were total losers. They were both crazy alcoholics. His parents grew moonshine and tobacco, or they made moonshine. They used to put booze in the baby bottles for the kids and watch the kids stagger around the living room drunk and they would laugh at it. It was an evening entertainment. They didn't have TikTok back then. He started smoking in preschool. A.A. Allen started smoking in preschool. How the heck does a four-year-old kid start smoking? I don't even know, but that's what happened to the poor guy. Wow. At age four, he was a stepdad was an abusive alcoholic, beat him, beaten on him. He ran away at 11. He ran away at 14 to get out of that stinking mess. He died in a hotel in San Francisco on June 11th, 1970. Let me ask you something. Look at this guy's background. In your opinion, is this a great person with all kinds of potential? Is this somebody you'd call lucky? I don't think so. Who's that guy? Oh, William Branham. William Branham. Believable. This guy had so many gifts and so many miracles, it was pathetic. He had the gift of knowledge at such a high level, he would 
have the person come on the platform and tell them their phone number or their address or something. I mean, this guy was enormous. He had so many healings, it was ridiculous. Hundreds of them. How the heck did he get all that power? Well, it must have been, he must have been raised great, wasn't he? Well, wait a minute here. His mom was 15, his dad was 18 when he was born. He lived in a shack in Kentucky. The floor was dirt. Raised in total poverty. Moved to Phoenix when he was 19 to work on a ranch. Younger brother died. He had to move home to help take care of the family. He had appendectomy one day, but had a near-death experience, and God called him while he was having his surgery. Died in 1965. Now, is this somebody you would say, well, this guy's got a great background. Well, he's really something special. I don't think so. Who's this guy? Yeah. What'd he do? Azusa Street Revival. Biggest revival ever hit America. He started it. This guy must have been raised royalty, right? I don't think so. His parents were slaved and lived slaved and living on a plantation. Okay? He was a field worker as a child. He never even went to first grade. He had seven siblings that were all broke, all raised in poverty. He had self-taught to learn to read. All he had was a Bible. He got smallpox when he was a kid and was blind in his left eye. 1906 started the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. Died of a heart attack in 1922. Died in his wife's arms. Well, this guy doesn't sound like he was very lucky either. No, he, was. he wasn't. Who's this person? Well, this is a, this human being right here. You take a look at it and you go, boy, there's nothing there. Yeah, I agree that looking at her, there's nothing there. But you take a look at her background and father died when she was a kid. Farm laborer when she was in grade school. Grew up married a guy named Wordworth, who was a wife abuser. Treated her like garbage, suffered from depression, cheated on her constantly, constantly verbally abusing her and running her down. Five of her six kids died. She buried five of her six children. Only one of them buried her. Her second husband, Etter, was a great guy, loved the stuff and honor her. She buried him too. And she died it when she was 80. What happened? What kind of a ministry did this woman have? Well, she was the most anointed human being that ever lived in Arizona, in the United States. This gal was at the top. She was kind of like our Apostle Paul. When she came to town as an evangelist, the whole town shut down. Everybody got saved. Everybody got healed. The bars shut down. The whorehouses shut down. Everything. Everybody got saved. John Lake was pretty impressive, wasn't he? You know what he said? He told his people to pray like Sister Edder. <laughs> she didn't have a very good background either, did she? I don't think so. Kind of. A lot of sadness and heartache in her childhood. All of these people had were raised very poorly, were they not? Who's this guy? Yeah. This guy was a crazy faith healer. Had all kinds of miracles, all kinds of incredible things happened to him. His dad was a gambler when he was young. He was a drunk. He left the family. His mother was stuck raising seven kids alone. She couldn't do it, so she had to park a bunch of them in an orphanage. One of them was Jack. He sent to the or orphanage at age eight. 
His brother got hit by a car when he was young. At age 17, he left the orphanage. He was already a full-blown alcoholic at the time. He had a heart attack in his 20s, went in the military, was in and out of the psych ward in the military, got malaria in 1944, lost 95 pounds, had a near-death experience, and God called him. <laughs> well, he had a glorious background, didn't he? No, he had a terrible background. All these people had horrible backgrounds, but they ended up with what? Unbelievable anointings from God. They were all raised terrible. They all had terrible parents. Their parents were drunks. Usually they were drunks. Everything was bad. Nothing was good. Everything sucked. How in the world did they end up with all this Holy Ghost power? Hmm. Well, it's, actually, this is all biblical, what I'm showing you here. This is regular people in this generation. But King David was a, uh, an adulterer and a murderer. He ended up the greatest king in the history of Israel. Samson was a sex, sex addict, used mightily of God. Solomon was given enormous gifts from God. He was the king of Israel when he was just a, basically a teenager. Apostle Paul was a serial killer. He ended up with the greatest ministry anybody's ever had. Peter, Peter was a fisherman, laborer, you know, big mouth, ran his mouth like a busted chainsaw. I thought, you know, had deep-seated insecurities. You ever talk to somebody who talks all the time? Don't raise your hands, but or don't point at anybody. But those people have deep-seated insecurities, and, and they have deep-seated anxiety running in their soul, so that they're always talking to you and telling, explaining things to you. But they want you to understand what they're saying. What is it? You listen to them because they fear you don't listen to them. It's it's subconscious. So they talk all the time and they babble all the time. And they talk all the time because they want you to listen to them because they're scared. That was Peter. He had a big mouth, ran his mouth all the time. Scared little boy. Little boy never left him till the day of Pentecost. Matthew was human pond scum. You talk about human garbage. Matthew was it. The Romans hated his guts because he was a tax collector and he was betraying his own people. The Jews hated him even more. Why? Because he was a tax collector betraying his own people. The nobody liked him. He had no friends except other tax collectors who were all pond scum. Nobody liked him. What happened to him? Well, I'll say, I'll say something great happened to him. Mary Magdalena, what happened to her? She was a broken down, busted up prostitute. She was finished. What happened to her? Oh, man. She got delivered, ministered to the Lord. Zacchaeus, oh man, you think Matthew sucked? Oh, Zacchaeus was the supervisor of the Matthews. See, he got a, Arctalonus is the Greek word, he got a cut out of everybody under his umbrella. See, like Jeff Bezos, right? I guess he's the richest man in the world or close to it, but he gets a cut out of everything you buy on Amazon. What's the last thing you bought on Amazon? Keychain. Key there she is, keychain. Look at her. She looks like the type of buy keychain. <laughs> well, he got a cut of that keychain. That's right. You lose it already? It's right there? Oh, there it is. She's hauling around with you. Proud of her keychain. Bezos got a piece of that. Well, Zacchaeus got a piece of every nickel they stole from the Jews. Every nickel that came in, he got a skim off of it. Mafia. He was rich. He was a super bag of human garbage. What happened to him? Well, wow. a lot of great things happened to him. Philip and Stephen, who were they? Nothings and nobodies. They got saved, and they wanted to serve the Lord. They said, well, 
you got to do grunt work. Okay? You're a grunt laborer. Table service. You know why there's so many Christians now who have no anointing? They're just basically useless. They want to start out up here. They don't understand that God doesn't do that. He flips it. You start out down here, and I'll bring you up here. Nobody heard that. Stephen and Philip got that. They said, hey, I'll serve tables. What happened to them? Well, a lot of great things happened to them. Why? They were table server. There was nobody special. They were no big deal. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, oh, liars, deceivers, you know, they had character flaws. What happened to them? They were three of the great patriarchs of the Old Testament. What about Joseph as a kid? What was he like? He was Peter when he was 12. This guy ran his, ran his mouth like a foghorn on a live bait boat. Maul. This guy was a complete loser. They were so sick of him. You know what they did with him? Dumped him in a well. Let me, let me explain something to you. When you get dumped in a well, you got problems. You got a problem. And it was his personality, not the well. What happened to him? Well, Prince of Egypt. Wow. Rahab, what was she? Some broken down hooker and what she do? Wow. Saved the spies. They saved her life and her family. Everybody in her family was saved. She was a scummy person, wasn't she? Yeah, of course they were. Who, what about Gideon? Well, he came from a Mickey Mouse family tree. There was no nothing of any value in his family tree. He even told Jehovah that. He said, well, who am I? My family, it's, there's nothing to it. What happened to Gideon? Why? Well, a lot happened to Gideon. What about Aaron? Oh, the Peter of the Old Testament. Aaron loved to pontificate. He was a pontificator. If he had a thought, he had to share it. If he thought about something, he said, it must be right. I thought of it. And if I thought of it, I need to share it. You ever been around somebody like that? Kind of makes you want to go back to drinking, doesn't it? People run their mouth all the time. You wish they'd just shut up. No. No chance. <laughs> not, not Aaron, man. God even pointed it out. He said, Moses. Moses, listen. I need you to go to Egypt. Stop making excuses. Look, hey, there's your brother over there coming up the mountain there. I know he talks well. I mean, Aaron talked so much and ran his mouth so often. In heaven, they heard the guy. They were sick of it. You know, when the people, when, when angels in heaven are tired of listening to you talk, you talk too much. The guy was a certified idiot. What happened to him? He became the high priest of Israel. Wow. Manassas, what happened to him? Oh, he was eight years old. Eight years old. You're the king of Israel. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Hell came to breakfast. He was the worst king Israel ever had. Bottom of the barrel. Human garbage. What happened to him? A lot of great things happened to him. You read these stories? If you haven't, please go back and read them. City of Nineveh. What happened to that? A city founded by the worst human that ever lived. Nimrod. The rottenest, stinkingest, filthiest, nastiest, sinful person that ever lived. Nimrod founded this city. God said, I'm going to burn this thing to the ground. But... I'm going to give him one more chance. I'll contact my servant, Jonah. And I'll send him over there and tell him. He'll warn him. Huh. Yeah. 
gentleman goes, I'm prejudiced. I'm a racist. I hate Ninevites. So what did he do? He did kind of what you've been doing over the years, only not near as dramatic. He ran away from God's call on his life. You've got a call on your life you haven't answered or you screwed up. You know something? You can have that call restored. It's restored. It's not exactly the call you got when you were younger, but God modifies it and keeps it. And Jonah ran from his call and then through a series of gentle persuasions, he was he was able to go to Nineveh. Guess what God did? Yeah, the Ninevites, man. They let the uh, city of Nineveh lasted a hundred more years before it was destroyed. Hundred years after they repented, God had mercy on them. Wow, Mother Mary, what happened to her? She from low income, middle income family. Miriam was her name, right? She had the same name as Moses' sister. She was basically a nothing. What happened to her? <laughs> Quite a bit happened to Mother Mary. My goodness. Shepherds were in their fields at the birth of Christ. What's a shepherd? Well, that's a, a labor job. You know, that's not a, a CEO upper management position. You're out in a field somewhere. Smelling sheep 24 hours. You ever been around sheep? Uh, some of my relatives in the Midwest or in Illinois, they're, they have sheep. I visited there years ago. <clears throat> you know, I went out in the field. I didn't know anything about sheep. But I wanted to go out and see what they were doing. They, they, have, they have cattle. They have different animals. I thought, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm from the city. I'm a counselor. I sit behind the desk. I'm going to go out in the field and check out the farm of my relatives. They live in uh, Pittsfield, Illinois. Pittsfield, about an hour from Springfield. I went out in the field. I'm looking at the sheep. They're looking at me. They're looking at me like I'm a complete idiot. I'm talking to one of them. I was trying to do some interaction. I'm talking to this one, and he starts pooping. <laughs> you know, I'm getting a whiff of the place, and I, you know, you're kidding me. You hang around sheep all day. Okay, it takes a certain personality type to be around sheep all day. Have you ever noticed that? Okay, that's, that's not a high-tech job. Sheep. Stupid. They even look stupid. They may have been intelligent, but to me they look like box of rocks dumb. And if they don't have any courtesy, then talk to me and, and stop pooping while they're talking to me. I'm, that's it for me. I don't have time. I don't have time for you. You're going to poop while I'm talking to you? That's it. I'm done. That's just the way I am. Don't do it. I'm out. You're going to do that? I'm not, I don't want to see you. Yeah, so I went, I went back in the house. Went back in the house. Shepherds, that's a low income job. What, what happened to them? <laughs> wow. A lot of great things happened to them. Anybody with me? What about the woman at the well? Whoa, she was a gasping loser. Loaded with rejection demons. How do you know somebody has rejection demons? Well, while you're interviewing them, if you see a pattern of broken relationships in their lives, that's him. Divorce, 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 breakup, breakup, breakup. Lost my friend, lost my friend. Breakups, constant chronic breakups. That's them. That was her. She had four, five, six husbands. Living with a guy. All of them losers. She was destroyed. You know, you can have but like three marriages, maybe four at the max, until you're out completely out of your mind. You're gone. If you're on the fifth or sixth one, 
you're certifiable. That's too much heartache, too much disappointment, too much pain, too much agony for one human being to stand. She had five or six bad men. What happened to her? She became an evangelist. She went back to her town and won the whole town to Christ. Everybody in town came out to see the Son of God because of her testimony. She said, hey, this guy out there, you're not going to believe it. He told me everything I ever did. How can that be? I think he's the son of God. And they all ran out there. Jonah saved Nineveh. The prodigal son, where did he come from? Well, he came from royalty, but he lost it all. Have you, did that happen to you? Did you used to be a successful person and then everything fell apart on you? Is that what happened? Yeah, you might have ended up like him in a pigsty. Okay. My relatives in uh, Illinois are also pig farmers. So after the joy of the sheep, I then headed over to another other acreage that had, that had these huge tin buildings. They were just gigantic. Looked like the size of a football field. And they kept all the hogs in there. See? And so we walk up to the door, and my cousin says to me, Mike, listen, uh, uh, Put this over your mouth. He hands me a rag. I said, what do I need this for? He said, well, you know, some people uh, can't take the smell in when, they, when we go in to see the hogs. And there's, there's like, I mean, rows of hogs. These aren't a couple of piglets running around. This, this is a professional operator. Hogs everywhere. Hogs everywhere. Uh, have you ever been to Walmart like it? Midnight or one in the morning? Okay. Use your vision. Extrapolate it. Walmart rows of people with pants down to here, cracks up to here. Think pigs. Pigs clear down there. I mean hogs clear down. I said, well, you know, listen, you know, I'm an adult. I don't need a rag. Come on. This is a no big. What are you talking about? I'm starting to think, you know, my cousin's a bunch of wusses. Okay, go on in, Mike. All right, let's go in and check out the hogs. Boom. Fright night. My eyes started watering. I grabbed them and I stuffed it. Could not believe the stink in that building. It was the worst smell I've ever been exposed to in my life. Bar none. Pigs. Pig poop. Unbelievable. Asphyxiating stench. Am I exaggerating? On my mother's grave. I am not exaggerating. I, 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 was, I stopped. I took a whiff in. I was, dear God. I wasn't even serving the Lord then. I started praying. <laughs> I didn't know how to pray. I started praying. I was gagging myself to survive. Go on in, Mike. He's, he's fine with it. He's not wearing a thing. He just walks in like he's in a flower shop. I mean, that's an acquired smell? Really? I could not believe it. I swear it. I could not believe the level of stench in that building. It was frightening. Frightening. I was squinting. My eyes were dripping. The prodigal son. Yeah. In America, it's not immoral to raise pigs. There, it was immoral to raise pigs. That's why Jesus used that example. He was telling you that a human being can sink so low, but if they repent, nobody is beyond God's mercy. No one. Yeah, I went in there. I was I had to, I looked around for two or three minutes. Well, this is good. Let's go. 
out the dope. The Philippian jailer, remember him? Paul, all beat up in stocks. Jailers back then were brutal taskmasters. They beat people. They tortured them. What happened to that jailer? A lot of good things happened to him. Moses was a murderer and a fugitive. Wow. Moses was a typical born-again Christian. You ask him why they're not doing something or why they're doing this or why they're not doing that. You know what they come up with? Excuses. They always come up with excuses. Well, this didn't work out. That didn't happen. They didn't help me. They let me down. One excuse after another. Moses, the king of excuses. Nobody had more excuses than Moses. Can you imagine that? People come into counseling and see me and they give me a bunch of excuses. Well, I'm, I'm just Mike. Moses wasn't talking to Mike. He was talking to God. Now, that's another level of excuse that you haven't been around. Have you made excuses in your past? Not like Moses. Okay, Moses was the king of the excuses. He, God says, listen, I want you to go to Egypt, and I want you to bring out two, three million Jews. Out. We're going to take them out to the desert. Moses goes, I didn't hear you. I, what did you say? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, I, I've been in Egypt. Uh, they don't like me there. I'm not, I'm not going to go back. Hey, God says to him, hey, don't worry about it. You got your staff there, right? Okay, throw it down. Boop. Oh, look at that. It's turned into a boa constrictor. Pick it back up by the tail. It's a staff again. How do you like that? Moses goes, you're kidding, right? You want me to go back to Egypt with a stick that turns into a boa constrictor? Really? I don't think so. I'm not going. You read the story? You read that story? Well, Lord, you don't understand, man. I, I stutter. I mean, I was fine in Egypt, but when I left Egypt, I started stuttering. When I got out of here with these sheep. I can't speak right. And the Bible says Jehovah got frustrated with him, started getting, started getting angry. I don't do that in a counseling session. I don't get angry at them. They just give me a bunch of excuses. I go, okay, that's where we are. God, no. You give God excuses right to his face? Are you kidding me? That takes a lot of nerve. That takes a lot of guts to do that. Could you do it? I don't think you would do it. He did it right to his face. I can't talk. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not, I don't have this. I don't have that. One excuse after the other. What happened to him? You know, a lot of great things happened to him. Remember that story? Sure you do. Let's go back to Corinthians and the, the carnal church. Here we go. He says, you see your calling, brethren. Ecclesis is an invitation. God is inviting you to your ministry. You got an invitation from God. Moses had one at the burning bush. He tried to get out of it, but he finally accepted it. He says, brethren, not many wise men after the flesh and not many dunatas, powerful people, are called by God. I've already proven that. I went through a long list of ministers, right? Then I went through a long list of Bible characters. Proving that not many powerful people are called. Not many Yuganes, people with royalty in their background, are called by God to serve. Those people are, they don't get in. God has Eklego. You know what Legos are? 
You ever heard of Legos or to toys kids buy? You didn't know that was in the Bible, do you? Yeah. Well, these Legos, you know, come in the box. And when you want to make something, you pick out a Lego. Pick that one out. That one clicks there. This pick this out. You throw that over there so your parents can step on it. And then you pick this, <laughs> pick that up there. See, and the ek Lego is what the Greek word means to pick out. God picked you out of a box of Legos. He picked you. You were chosen, picked out of a group. Why? What does moros mean? We get our English word morons. Can you believe it? Did you did are you glad you came here tonight? <laughs> Can you believe the people are so happy to hear me teach? Preacher, you can't believe it. People look at me and they go, wow, please keep teaching, Brother Mike. Yeah, you're a moron. And that's why you were picked. You were picked out. Now, I know some of you, and I know that's true. I also know God's picked you out. You've been picked out of a group a box of Legos, you pick. What's that mean? That means that if the world thinks you're a moron and they have no respect for you at all, that's the person God f looks over at. Wait a minute, everybody thinks you are garbage? God skips them and goes to Garbageville. God chose the weak things to kataiskuno. What does that mean? Shame. Shame what? Iskoros. People who run and rule by force, you know, dictators, uh, the government, um, uh, dominant personalities in the family, trying to control every narcissist. Trying to control everybody in the family or at the workplace. God looks around and he goes, hey, here's a bunch of weak people. And the, here's the guys who are in control. I'm going to choose them. Like Lego, he picks out the weak ones first. He chose, he chooses what? Agenes. People who have no nobility. Kings and queens and their lineage, oh, that's great, is it? For God, he ignores that and goes to the weak morons and he picks them out first. He chooses what? My gosh, people who are despised by others. See what these verses are? It's, a, it's sociology. Did you take sociology in school when you were in college? I did. I got an A in it. Yeah. I don't remember what I studied, but I know. I think it was interesting. But anyway, what it is is this. God, God passes up the gorgeous looking steers, and he goes over to the pig barn where I was and goes in and picks out some pigs. 
He skips over these people with PhDs and he goes over here to find somebody with a GED. Picks them out at Lego, picks them out first. They're right here. The things that are may means what? Nah. You ever done that to anybody? I have. Nah. Nah. If you're a nah, he goes to you first. And Eklego picks you out of the group. Are you despised by others? Perfect. He picks you out here. Are you mentally ill? You got bipolar or something, schizophrenia? God goes to them and picks them first. You got bipolar? Oh, Eklego, pick up. Why does he do all that? Well, here it is. Cater Gale to abolish the things that are so that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know what's great about people that don't have anything or people that are losers or people that had bad upbringings? A.A. A. Allen, Sister Edder, Jack Ho. Huh? You know what's, you know what's great about them? They had terrible upbringings. They had no chance at life, no shot at all, nothing. What happened to them? He, they got picked out. Branham, he got picked out in a surgery. He was dying in a surgery and God came to him. He got picked like a Lego toy. All these Corinthians, they were all sinners. They sinned in ten ways. I read them off. Remember? Ten levels of sin. What happened to them? God picked them out. Those faith healers had one miracle after the other. Why? They had horrible lives. Seymour couldn't even read when he was young. He worked on a plantation. Come on, that's the lowest of lows if you're working on a plantation, right? That's it. Racism, slavery, I mean, that's the bottom of the barrel. Guess who went looking for Seymour? The Holy Ghost went looking for him. I'll take this guy right here. Yeah, he's picking cotton. I'll take this one. What about the plantation owner? What about the mayor? What about the governor? I'll pass on them. I'll take the sharecropper's son right here. I'll take him. I'm going to use this guy here, a slave. Can't read? To start the biggest revival in American history. Boom. <laughs> I'm going to take uh, this guy here, and he was smoking and four years old smoking, full blown alcoholic at eight. I'm going to take him down the Miracle Valley down here, down here, right? And I'm going to send him every sick person on the United States. They're all going to get healed on TV. I'm going to, I'm going to take this guy, the drunk. Why? Listen, people that are down here, when they're brought up here, tend to be less egotistical and less apt to take credit for what God does. They tend to be more grateful as opposed to a successful person 
who's got a lot in life based on his own intelligence, his own hard work, and his own persuasiveness, they tend to have a little sense of themselves. But if God chooses somebody at the bottom of the barrel, they're more likely to be humble, they're more likely to be grateful that they were taken out of the dumpster and set up here at the head of the table, so to speak. And, and they won't take God's glory from them when the Holy Spirit moves. But he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but he says of him, are you in Christ? Okay? Who out of God, ek is out of, out of God is made to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, sanctification, and redemption. What's he saying there? Listen, I'm choosing, choosing you, and you have flaws up to here, sins up to here, and failures up to here. But I'm choosing you deliberately okay, because I'm going to have my son renovate you with what? Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And you're going to be a humble servant for the Most High God, and you get the miracles. When you were drunk at age eight, you get A.A. A. Allen's Miracles. Were you a slave? You get to start the biggest revival in American history. Were your parents total losers like A.A. Hey, Allen? Did, did they put booze in your bottle and have you drink it and you stagger around the living room and everybody clapping and that's funny. Is that the kind of child abuse you went through or worse? Did you have worse child abuse than that? Good. Congratulations. Good for you. You've been picked out by God. You a victim of child abuse? Wonderful. Thank you. Happy for you. Were you abandoned as a kid? Your parents walk out on you? Did they dump you in the orphanage like Jack Coe? Good. Good for you. Were you raised by step parents or adopted parents who were perverts? Good for you. Thank you, Jesus. Why? You've been chosen by God for miracles. Were you raised in poverty? Were you? Like Bill Branham? Were you? Did your house have no floors? It was just dirt in your house, right? No plumbing, no electricity. Congratulations. Good for you. You've been chosen by God for miracles. Here he quotes Jeremiah chapter 9. This is what people who come from nothing tend to do. They tend to receive benefits from God and they don't take credit for it. They give him the glory. Somebody who's self-sufficient, self-absorbed, self-successful tends to kind of look at themselves, tends to kind of lean on themselves, tends to kind of look at themselves. One of the miserable things about my ministry is helping people who, are, who have high IQs. They're just terrible. And I'm kind of at the age now where slowing down a little bit, so I usually give those to Stephanie. But anyway, um, <laughs> people with high IQs are a major problem. 
major problem. You think too much. They're too used to self problem solving. See? And they're not humble. They don't have any brokenness because they're used to resting on their mind. I can figure it out. Those people, <laughs> we can't get any demons out of them. It's so hard. Sad, too. Sad. I'm sad. I've had some really smart people come in my office. You know, and they sit down, and within 60 seconds, I already know they're like twice as smart as I am. So I know I'm going to probably end up yelling at them. And yelling is a blessing, an anointing that I picked up about 14 years ago. And it's, it's a method I use sometimes to try and shock someone who who's, has a high IQ out of their intelligence. You know, and I get right up in their face and I go, what are you doing? <laughs> or something of that nature. It's all inspired. Don't worry about it. People that are something, particularly in their own minds, but legitimately are something, you know, they're hard. They, they, don't, they don't work well with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, uh, you know, his personality is very servant-oriented, you know? And he kind of gravitates to people that have servant's heart, not people that like to be in charge and the boss. He likes servants, see? Christ, the epitome of servanthood, obviously. Servants don't take the glory. Well, take a look at Jesus. Uh, here you have the greatest person in the history of the universe, and he's born in a Bethlehem, a nowhere place. Raised in Nazareth, kind of a neighborhood rat hole. His parents were nothing. They were working class people. After he was born, they tried to get a room at the hotel, but there wasn't one, so they went out to the barn. She has the baby out in the barn. And uh, I, seriously, if, if, I seriously doubt if it smelled like that pig farm I was at. Okay, I don't think they would have made it, but this was a regular barn, but... A fatne is a food trough where you put grain and stuff in and mules and horses or what have you eat out of it. So they cleaned out a food trough and they put God's holy son in a food bin. That was his bed. The king of kings. What's going on here? What's a technon? It's somebody who works with their hands, you know, carpentry, um, upholstery, clothing, uh, bricklaying, whatever. We don't know what kind of profession Joseph and Jesus had, but we do know that it was a manual labor job. A technon is a manual labor, somebody who works with their hands, somebody who builds things. So everybody says he was, he was a carpenter. That's fine. Could have been. Doesn't matter. The point being, there's no royalty in doing that. That's a working class, middle, lower class job. The point is, the point being made, a technon. That's not an elevated, glorious position. It's a living, you know. Jesus became a curse for us, and he became sin for us, and was butchered and murdered on the cross at Calvary. That's as humble as you can get, isn't it? When he died, he didn't even have any place to be buried. Joseph from the Sanhedrin, they had had a vote that day, and he voted no, don't kill him. Joseph was on the Sanhedrin, and he, wanted, he voted no, he should, that he should live. Well, he was outvoted, and they took him to Pilate to, to murder him. And Joseph did an end around on him and knew he didn't have a a grave. He couldn't afford a grave. Yeah. He didn't have a sepulcher, no place to be buried. 
This is the son of God. He didn't have a place to be buried. He couldn't pay his taxes and he needed a miracle to pay him. He said, Peter, go down to the lake. Go down there and throw in the hook. And the first catch you get, it'll have some kind of money in it. Take that money and go pay the taxes. We don't have any money. We're broke. Why do you think Judas left? He had enough of it. What's the point here? The point here is Jesus is setting the example here of the kind of people he's looking for to send the Holy Ghost with a rack of miracles. Jesus, the Son of God, the humblest person in the world, got the Holy Spirit without measure, John 3. Why? Wherefore, my beloved, Philippians 2, as you have always obeyed me, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Paul says, work out your own salvation with, oh, wow. Listen, people that have pride and are arrogant are not able to do this. They cannot do that. Therefore, they don't get the miracles. They don't get the anointing. They don't get the special call of God in their lives. They don't get the glory of Seeing people healed and delivered and whatever God has for you, they miss out on it. They miss out on everything. The bus leaves them at the terminal. And they grow old and they fail and then they die. In that order. Humble people are different. Eh? Arrogant people sin, they don't give a rat's fanny. <laughs> you know why? Pride. They don't care. If you sin and you, you're sorry, you hurt your Heavenly Father for doing that, oh man, you're in line for something huge. If you don't care, well, I got, I got greasy grace, it's covered, I'm fine. Yeah. Your chances of getting a miracle are slim to nothing. Humble people are sorry they hurt their Heavenly Father because they love Him. They're sorry they hurt Him. They feel bad about it. Wouldn't that be a normal reaction for somebody that loves somebody else and they've hurt them? I hurt you and I feel bad about it. Arrogant people are not like that. You're fine. Toughen up. It's all good. They just float over it. Well, those people aren't going to get any miracles. They're not going to get healed. They're not going to get any deliverance. That's not going to happen. You know what would happen here tonight? Yeah. I'd give anything to see it. If everybody that came down this altar came down with fear and trembling, we would have a blowout you wouldn't even believe. There'd be fire on the roof or something. Some weird thing would happen. No, no, you'll, you'll do it again. Is it all true? Well, okay, I guess I'll go down and try one more time. Oh, oh man. If that's your attitude, would you kind of wave at me like that? So you get Kelly to pray for you, I'll get over here. People that have fear and trembling over their behavior, their Heavenly Father heard them, he saw it. Wow. Those people are in line for huge blessings from God. King David was what? The God? A man after my... What? Now how could a certified, bona fide, glorified screw up like David possibly have that said about him. How could that be? Sounds crazy. Actually, it's perfect. You know why? He would screw up royally. 
I mean royal. Literally, he was a king. He was a royal screw-up. And he would come back to God on his knees, broken. Why? He was working out his salvation with fear and trembling. He wasn't taking stuff for granted. Like greasy gracers do. Oh, I'm, I'm forgiven. All right, I'll, I'll repent. Dear Jesus, forgive me. All right, I'm done. What? Who do you think you're fooling? I mean, are you that stupid? Mickey Mouse prayer like that's going to... I'm sorry, that's not going to work. Why doesn't that happen? Well, it's psychological. Psychiatrically, a human being that's exposed to repetitive, long-term disappointments has trouble feeling God. The demons condition them to facing chronic disappointments. This didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen. And pretty soon, this kind of sense and darkness kind of develops in the person's soul. And it's kind of a satanic expectation that the next thing is going to be a disappointment too. And of course, your faith falls after that. And then the prayers never get answered. What happens if you do have this fear and trembling for God? Guess what? The Holy Spirit inside of you, energeo, energizes you to thalo, want to do the will of God. God implants in your spirit a desire to serve him. It comes from within. Energero means to be energized, to be capable of doing something. Capable of doing what? Wanting to serve God. Most people don't serve God. Why? Because they don't want to pay the price for it. You mean I got to give up this and I got to start doing that? Oh, no. What do you want to do? Eudokia. What does that mean? Things that God likes. What's he like most of all? You fulfilling your destiny. You got a destiny and a call from God in your life. And Father wants to fulfill that. And if it doesn't happen, he's disappointed. He's disappointed. Why? He had all these gifts he wanted to give you and couldn't do it. He's disappointed. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. What does condemnation mean? Krino is a Greek word. It means judgment. God's not judging you. He's trying to give you all these benefits. God's a good God, the Bible says. God is love. He wants you to have these things. And if he can't give them to you, he's disappointed. Are you going to disappoint him tonight? I don't think so. Come on now. Raise your hand if you were raised like human garbage, like A.A. Allen, Jack Coe. Look at all the hands that went up. Look at all the hands that went up. These are divine appointments. See them hands going up? Those are special hands. You were raised like garbage. You guys were raised where I was with my cousins in a giant pig barn. And you've been ekleko, picked out by God. You're a special chosen person. 
what's going to happen to you? Well, I don't know, but it could be an incredible healing ministry like A. A. Allen. He was a he was human garbage. It could be starting a revival somewhere. Seymour was total garbage. Bill Branham was trash. Sister Edder, wow. She had nothing. She was nothing. Nothing. It's the only, there's only one place, nothing is good. One place. That's at the cross. Having nothing is not good anywhere else in life except at Calvary. What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to psychiatrically trick you. I'm trying to get you to think of yourself as a benefit because you were raised like crap. I'm trying to get you to see that as an asset, not a liability. I'm trying to get you to see that as a launching pad to the supernatural. Don't raise your hand, but ladies, anybody here have four, five, six husbands? I hope there's several of you. Congratulations. Anybody who's had four, five, six hundred husbands is a complete loser. You are right in line for miracles from God. Five husbands? Perfect. 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 There was a woman at the well that had five. She became an evangelist. Do you have a disability like Seymour? You're blind in one eye. Are you blind in your spirit, man? Are you? What is it? What's your disability? Do you have one? Good for you. Good for you. Perfect. Perfect. Did you have smallpox? Oh, good. Good, good, good. Don't raise your hand, but do you have herpes? <laughs> Wonderful. How about AIDS? Anybody got that? Good. Great. Fabulous. Great. Anybody here have no family? They abandon you? Good for you. God love you. Yes. Can I get an autograph? You are in line for the supernatural. When I was a kid, you know, I don't know if I ought to tell this story, but I'll take a shot at it. You know, my, my parents were alcoholics and, you know, I had a kind of a crazy childhood. Uh, many people had it much worse. But, you know, I was in, my mom, my sister and I, my sister was a, uh, a couple of years younger than me. We were in uh, fourth grade. I was in fourth grade. My sister was in second grade. We went to visit my grandpa in Kansas. And we came back to our house in Edwardsville, Illinois. That's where we were living at the time. My dad was a total loser and he was a truck driver. Truck driver. My mom was a homemaker. They were both drunk and everything, and we didn't have any money and so on. And my mom and my sister and I, we come back from Kansas. And we go, we get home, and my dad's there, and there's a blonde woman there. Her name's Karen, and her two kids are there. And they were uh, younger than me. Uh, one was a boy, one was a girl. And uh, they were like my sister's age, maybe like second graders or something. I didn't know what was going on. I was in fourth grade. I did not know what was, what was happening. But what had happened was my dad was having an affair with this woman. 
and he moved her into our house while we were on vacation visiting my grandpa. We come back, and of course, everything went to hell in the handbasket after that. My mother was drunk every night and just, just destroyed. My, everything was terrible. We ended up moving out and so on. But I wish I would have had, I wish I would have run into a brother Mike back then. You know what? I wish I would have run into brother Mike, and I wish he would have explained to me this story. You know, I wish I would have known this in Edwardsville, Illinois, when I was in fourth grade. Because I would have seen all that going on in my house. I would have said, man, this is great. I've, I'm being picked out by God to do something for him in life. Yeah, but I didn't have any brother Mike. There wasn't, there wasn't none around there. Yeah. No, I had men, you know, we went on with our miserable lives, but I wish I would have had this information back then. I would have, I would have lived a completely different life. I would have, I, had I known that God was picking me out because my dad ran off with some woman and, the, and he, their kid, her son was sleeping in my bed. The daughter was sleeping in my sister's bed. Had I known that, I would have said, thank you, Jesus. I would have cranked out the praise. I said, my God, this is great. My parents are drunk. Some crazy bubble-headed bleach bond moved into my house with her two kids. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm going to be like Bill Branham. That's me, Mike Branham. I didn't have any of that information. I didn't know anything about it. I had an excuse. You ain't got one. You don't have one. There's a target on your back. A Holy Ghost target. If that's how you were raised, or worse than I just told that story I just told you, something probably worse happened to you. Worse. You were picked out by God, chosen by God. Base thing in the world, things that are despised, things that are not, to bring down the things that are. Unbelievable, 1996, my youngest daughter, 16 years old, brought me home. I come home. Now I'm standing right here, hoping you'll do the same. Let's pray.